Pies and puddings really sum up the strengths of Britain's food culture. It's good grub that's easy to make, delicious to eat, and I love it. Hello and welcome to Pies and Puds. I'm on a mission to pay tribute to the nation's favourite comfort foods and I hope I can inspire you to recreate these tempting recipes. Here's what's on my menu today. I'll be making a cheese, potato and onion pie full of rich flavour, thanks to a mature cheddar made at a unique creamery in the North Yorkshire Moors. This is your beautiful cheese. Now, I'm going to grate quite a big chunk of this, actually, because I think it's going to go exceptionally well inside this pie. I'll be rummaging through the hedgerows to find the flavours I need for my lemon and lavender posset growing wild in the English landscape. Do you know what it's like? This is like uh, you're going down a supermarket. <laughs> I know. And you're thinking, uh, yeah, we need to, oh, do we need yeah. some blackberries? Yeah, yeah. take some of that. Yeah. Fennel, we need some of that. And chocolatier Paul Young teaches me the art of tempering. Right, swap hands, do as told. So you're going to scrape from the outside in. OK. Which turns my chocolate and prune tart into a showstopper. All of a sudden, the aristocrat pops up here. Whoa, hang on a minute, what's this? Then all my guests join me to try today's dishes. My first recipe is a refreshing lemon and lavender posset, which is full of flavours that are new to me, the essence of wild flowers. I grew up in an urban environment, but now Kent is my adopted county. I live surrounded by fields. I spent the day with someone who showed me a new way of looking at the countryside I thought I knew. Known as the Garden of England, Kent is a fertile region and many ingredients even grow wild here. One local who knows where to find them is foraging expert Lucia Stewart. So this is wild horseradish here. Wild horseradish, yeah, big, magnificent curly leaves with, with veins. Yeah, but I've seen this before, I didn't even realise what it was. I didn't even know it, it existed. Oh. We've been given permission to sort of dig it up. Brilliant, that's it, yeah. Look at that. Wow, that, that's really strong. Uh, you could smell the end bit there, you could get a whiff, but that... Yeah, yeah. That's and incredible. it's lovely. And and then, oh, yeah, I love that. It makes you think of roast beef. It does. <laughs> Doesn't it? Bring yeah, absolutely. I like to bake with all kinds of local ingredients, but I'm not so familiar with what's in the undergrowth. Luckily, Lucia can tell me which wild flavours are useful. Do you think, then, based on the fact that there are so many sort of wild foods out there, foods that you can go and pick for your own consumption, that could you live off the land? We could, but why not combine it with the best of both worlds? So you use, the, you use the wildflowers, you use the herbs to enhance the food? Yeah, natural flavourings, very creative, and uh, yeah, opens a, a very new world. Lucia tells me there are lots of weird and wonderful ingredients in the undergrowth, but here's one I recognise, the blackberry. I used to pick this a lot with my folks up near Blackpool. I don't know why it was always Blackpool. They are fantastic, aren't they? They're so varied, there's many species of bramble, and right next door is some fennel. Oh, the fennel, of yeah, course, that's yeah. The, that's the wild fennel, and this is a terrific culinary ingredient, much respected by the ancient Romans and Greeks for its medicinal property. Do you know what it's like? This is like uh, you're going down a supermarket. <laughs> yeah, I know. And you're thinking, uh, yeah, we need to, oh, do we need <laughs> yeah. some blackberries? Yeah, yeah. We'll take some of them. Yeah. Oh, fennel, we need some of that. There you go. I always say that. Oh, I've been shopping when I come back. <laughs> you, got your, you got your basket. <laughs> yeah. I'm just looking for the till down the bottom. Yeah. There's someone here somewhere. <laughs> These ingredients are a great addition to all kinds of recipes, and Lucia knows just about all of them, even the most obscure. I can see some rose bay willow herb, which is a pretty little summer flower over here. The shoots are edible in spring. They're recommended to be soaked to get the flavour out, and also drying helps get the flavour out too. In terms of flavours, you'll have a smell of this mugwort. That was used before hops to flavour uh. beers. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, isn't straight it? away, I can, yeah. I can, it's like beer, Kent beer. Yeah, exactly. That's a nice one. That does remind me of hops, though. <laughs> yeah. Leaving the country lanes, Lucia takes me to a garden to explore flavours that can be found on anyone's doorstep. What have we got here then? I know those guys. That is a wonderful bunch of lavender. 
That's lovely. I do know this one, usually recognised by its scent, not its flavour. One of the strange things is for me, actually, when I smell lavender, and I indeed eat lavender, it reminds me of banana. It's quite a versatile thing. Um, I mean, I think it does work in cakes. Mm. Is lavender difficult to grow in this country? English lavender was the best in the world, and you'd hear the street cries, like, lavender, lavender. So, no, it, we're very well suited for lavender. OK, so it, it, it is used to our sort of... It's, uh, you, it's ideal for weather. us. It is it used to be world-famous English lavender. OK. So what else are we looking at then? So we've got those. We've got a few little uh, marigolds over there, which oh, are yes. colourful cooking ingredient. They make teas in France, colourful yeah. Yeah. teas. Show me what's edible. Roses, I mean, I think immediately the Turkish delight. I think of uh, icing sugar and egg white, drying them out, eating them, use them as decoration on a cake. So what else have we got here? Beautiful nasturtiums from Peru, peppery tangy leaf, uh, fantastic shape for stuffing. Have a taste of that. You can eat this? You can eat it and it's peppery. I sprinkle it on pasta, full of vitamin C, so you've got all that as well. It's actually quite nice. Do you like it? Yeah. Can you eat the flour or can you, can you only eat the leaf? Um, I stuff the flour with cream cheese for canapes. I can understand why you put it with the cheese, because that, uh, the creaminess would really blend quite well yeah. with that. This has been a journey around Kent I've never experienced before. And to finish off, a glass of Lucia's own lemonade comes with an added flavour straight from the garden. It's lovely, whatever it is. Um, Have a guess. It's not rose. It's not ever well. Is it lavender? It's lavender. That's delicious. It's really refreshing. It's a little sweeter than lemonade. It sweetens the acid. Mm. When I go out walking the dog, I see a lot of this, just don't know what it is. So for me, it's given a different perspective on what Kent is. It's not just about apples and it's not just about the baking, the huffkins. It's not just about the soft fruit. It's also about these magic wild foods that are out there. But I think you have to gain the knowledge to know what you're looking for. There's a lot to be had, isn't there? I think so. And you just started me on a brand new path. Great. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
as it slowly begins to come to the boil. Now, this needs to come to the boil basically to dissolve the sugar that's in there at the moment. Once it's boiled, remove from the heat, leave to cool and add the juice of two lemons. You can use a, a juicer like this or just squeeze it if you're butcher manly, but I'm not. And once, once it's all dissolved, it's ready then to go straight into your jars, which is here. Now, if I get a jug to put this in, once it's gone in the fridge, it then sets, and that's what makes the posset. In medieval times, posset was a drink split and curdled by lemon juice, but today, the sugar stabilizes it into a mousse-like velvety texture. And it's such a clean food to have at the end of a meal. It's absolutely gorgeous. And now, traditionally, would they have a biscuit with it or something or not? Easy, easy. Oh, coming in. <laughs> now, this is going to go in the fridge. And to go with this, I'm going to make a lavender biscuit. Oh, great. <laughs> OK, this is going to go straight in the fridge. And you need to leave that to chill, preferably overnight. It just gives it time to set properly. Now, to make the biscuits, here I have some softened butter, to which I'm going to add some lavender straight in. It's a good time to add. It releases all the oils while you're beating the thing to death. It does smell fantastic at this stage. Beat in some caster sugar and flour. And then you bring all these ingredients together. So at this stage, I'm going to get my hand in. It's nearly there. Now, this is basically going to make a very crumbly biscuit. Pop that on the bench. Roll the dough into a sausage. Wrap in greaseproof paper and chill in the fridge for half an hour. And you end up with this, which is now easy to cut into biscuits. So take your pastry out, get a knife, and then cut little discs all the way along, and you just pop this onto a tray. Bake in the oven at 160 degrees for 20 minutes. Once they've gone golden, they're done. And over here are said biscuits. When I bring the posset out, look at these fellas. Mm. These are going to be absolutely delicious. After half an hour in the fridge, they're set nicely. Pop a couple of those on there with these gorgeous biscuits. Do you want some fresh pork? Because that's a bit more colourful. It is indeed. Yeah. <laughs> There you have it, lemon and lavender posset with lavender biscuits. This is a light, delicate way to finish your lunch, especially if you're eating in the garden. Lucia, we'll have to wait a little bit longer before we get a chance to eat it. Oh, shame. <laughs> Still to come, chocolatier Paul Young teaches me the gentle art of tempering. Scrape. The chocolate. I haven't it's done it yet, hang on. on. If that goes lumpy, we'll have to start all over again. Oh, no. Which I use on my show-stopping chocolate and prune tart. It's the sort of cake I grew up with, actually. With real gold on it? Yeah, all the time, I every Porsche. Sunday. And I find a cheddar with a heart, all the way from North Yorkshire for my cheese, onion and potato pie. You can feel the cheese in it, actually. You want to see those grains when you put it on top of the pie. As a baker, I temper chocolate occasionally, but I'm always happy to pick up tips from a master. And who better than expert chocolatier, Paul Young. How you doing? Hello, Paul. How you doing? You all right? I'm good. Paul is going to show me his easy yet effective decorations, but we'll come to that. My eyes were initially drawn to this box of chocolates. Good. Now, <laughs> you've got a huge selection here. I have. I know you do one. You do a champagne ganache one. It Which is. one is it? It's... This one or this one in the corner. Or that one. It's just champagne and chocolate, nothing else, which means it's really boozy, it's really strong. It's going to do the second one. Mm. You can taste the champagne. It sort of fizzes as well, yeah. because you've got that gorgeous chocolate as well. It is all about the chocolate. If you've got good chocolate, you can make good chocolates and chocolate products. You can't make bad chocolate taste good. So these are fresh chocolates here. So obviously the ones that are sort of commercially you buy these big boxes of, they, they, they seem to last forever. They do. They've got loads of preservatives, stabilisers. These are last seven days. Ooh, what's that one? That one is Bakewell tart. Is it's it? everything in a Bakewell tart in a truffle. It tastes just like it. You're getting that almond in there, a little bit of apricot flake in there. Yeah. 
Yeah. And you've got those nuts on the top as well. That's lovely. What about, about, you've got about a sausage roll one as well? I haven't got a sausage roll one, but I've got a goat's cheese one. Oh, have you? Yeah, it's like cheesecake. It goat's like... cheese? Yeah. It works. Try it. But with a delicate dark chocolate, you don't want the chocolate to overpower the goat's cheese. Well, you do. <laughs> I don't like goat's cheese. There's no limit to Paul Young's chocolates. He's also got Eccles cake, coffee, lime and lemongrass caramel with mango, and classic Rocher. Is there another layer? There isn't another layer, no. You've nearly eaten half, anyway. <laughs> so how much are you looking at for, like, one chocolate, then? One chocolate is two pounds. What? I know. We are, though, the London's only handmade chocolate company, believe it or not. I just think there's 16 quid's worth of chocolates. You have? 16 quid? Artisan chocolate, but we do use some of the best chocolate in the world from small producers as well. I'm probably going to give these to my mum for Christmas, but obviously I'm going to go and buy some cheap chocolates to fill in there, fill nice. in those holes there. Nice. So I'll just part that down <laughs> here for now. That's great. Thanks very much indeed. What are you going to show us now? So the key thing that intimidates everybody, as we've said, is tempering. Tempering simply means introducing strength to the chocolate. So when you see a really shiny Easter egg or a shiny bar of chocolate, mm. you know the chocolate's tempered. It's been heated and cooled and mixed on a granite or marble slab to then give it strength. So as the chocolate cools, it builds up strict crystals which form strength. Mm -hmm. And that's the key thing. It's basically making the chocolate stronger, yeah. shinier, and it makes it shrink ever so slightly. So that's how, when you've got a shiny bar of chocolate, it's been in a mould, and it shrinks out and leaves a glassy, shiny finish. Why do people get so scared of it? It is intimidating and it's the scariest part because it's technical. But technical things are perceived to be difficult until you simplify them down, you strip it back. It does take a few times to get it right, okay. but it's not as scary as it's, as it's been made out for a long time. Are you going to show us how to do it then? I'm going to show you exactly how to do it, a small amount of chocolate, which once you can do that, you can make chocolates, Easter eggs, decoration curls, swirls, you can do anything with chocolate once you can temper. All right. Now, I've got two, right. two bowls of chocolates here. You have. You're going to have a milk chocolate, I'm going to have the dark. So in the bowl is our melted chocolate, about 55 degrees, pour yep. just over two-thirds out onto the slab. Most chocolatiers use thermometers and all kinds of technical equipment. Paul Young teaches by eye. That's the clever thing. Milk chocolate's thicker. So you yep. can see this has gone much thinner and wider. Yeah, nice to see. Palette knife in your right hand, scraper in your left. You've got to spread out the chocolate. Once you've spread out and it's even thickness... Thank God, I haven't done this yet. You have to work quick or it'll set it. It'll go lumpy. Scrape the chocolate I in. I done it yet, hang on. If that goes lumpy, we'll have to start all over again. Oh, no. Right, swap hands. Do as told. So you're going to scrape from the outside in to the middle. So all the chocolate is going to end up where you poured it at the beginning. So what we're doing is spreading the chocolate to cool it, and if we left it on the slab, it would set solid. That's why we've left some melted chocolate in our bowl. Ah. We're going to stop it setting. OK. That's what we're looking for when it goes very, very thick. Well, what I'm going yeah. to do now is scrape that thick chocolate into my bowl of melted chocolate. That's it. Well done. That's brilliant. So and now then... you're two or three minutes of mixing to make sure that the temperature of the chocolate is even all the way through. And you'll notice it's very, very shiny now. Yeah. And it's because everything's emulsified together. The really traditional way to check if your chocolate is tempered. Dip a corner in, touch your bottom lip, and it should feel at body temperature, neither hot nor cold. Mm, feels about that. Yep. And once we know it's tempered, we can start using it. Once your chocolate is tempered, you can pour it into moulds, cover cakes, or something even crazier. This is the clever bit. You can do so many things with chocolate, but the easiest way to get something really modern and contemporary to really lift a tart is with acetate. Chocolate loves acetate sheets, and all you need to do is take a sheet, start to crumple it up. That's it. So if we just spoon on some chocolate, all we do now is pop that in the fridge yep. for two or three minutes till it's really, really, really crisp, peel off the plastic, and then we can decorate our tarts. So I'll pop this one in. It doesn't take very long at all. And then get decorating. After 15 minutes in the fridge, it's set. Yours. OK, so now you can hold them, look. They've, they've stiffened up. What we need to do is turn it over 
and you should be able to start to peel off the plastic. And don't worry, it will break into pieces. It's meant to. Lift them up by the edges and position them on the tarts in whatever design, what, decoration you, mix it up? you like. Yeah, you can mix it up. It's very thin, but what's good about it is if you've got a really, really delicate dessert, these are paper thin. Yeah. They're really, really great for anything where you don't or can't have weight on the top. That looks fantastic. I think with the chocolate shards on there, it looks very retro. Quite yeah, cool, it does. It? And that's not all from Paul. He'll be using more tempering tricks later to turn my chocolate and prune tart into a showstopper. When I was a lad, my dad's cheese and onion pasties were the best. Inspired by him, I'm going to make a cheese, onion and potato pie. And my search for the mature cheddar that the pie needs led to a village in North Yorkshire, where there's more to the cheese than meets the eye. For this recipe, I found a very special cheese indeed. Dale and cheddar tastes great and has a heartwarming story behind it. This is Botton Village, a self-sufficient community of five small farms deep in the North York Moors. It was set up in 1955 to offer adults with special needs and learning disabilities the support they need to enjoy a fulfilling life. They spend their days farming and working, and more importantly, enjoying the fruits of their labour. Well, the people with special needs, they have the opportunity to develop in the working environment, um, and the creamer is a good example of that, and, and reach a high level of skill. And it's very important in Bottom that they have that opportunity, and also that the work is for a reason and for a purpose. 280 carers, farmers and residents all live in the valley, most in shared houses as extended families of all ages and abilities. Much of the food that is eaten by the residents has been grown by them too, from fruit and veg, eggs, honey and, of course, milk and butter from the dairy herd. Alistair Pearson helps the residents with cheese production, including the cheddar I want to use in my pie. The cheese we're most proud of is the, um, the dill and cheddar. It's made with raw milk from the Bottom Village farms. It's one of the most successful cheeses we have. It's got a full-bodied taste, and uh, at the moment, the, the present cheddar that we're, we're selling is 20 months old. The cheese-making process starts at the crack of dawn. It's 5.30 a.m., milking time for the cows. Cows ready? Shall we get them? Yeah. Farmer Gilberto and resident David are in charge. Each farm has its own herd. With 12 cows, this is one of the biggest. David's role is to lead the cows to the parlour and help with the milking. Without the team that we have, we couldn't produce what we're doing. I mean, for myself, I certainly enjoy working with the people that we have, supporting the people we have, and seeing the satisfaction that they actually get from what they do. The milk is then taken to Botton's own creamery, where Alistair and his helpers have arrived and are ready to make all sorts of cheeses, including Gouda, Brie, and that all-important cheddar. Morning, Alistair. Come on, Nicole. So, 985 litres this morning. Alistair starts the cheese-making process and work is in full swing all over the farm. The vegetable patch is being cultivated, ready for next year's crops. Back at the creamery, the curds have been rested and are ready for the next stage. Ian Hatcher, who lives on one of Bottom's other farms, comes in to help Alistair every day. Ian's lived here for the past nine years and he takes great pride in making the cheese. I enjoy it. It's fun and I enjoy pushing them into the moulds. And it's a very good teacher. <laughs> the curds are then milled and pressed into moulds by hand. Alistair likes to keep it fun by turning part of the process into a competition. Huh? Oh, nearly, nearly to guess the exact weight. <laughs> you got too much in there, Ian. Oh, well. The curds are then stacked to allow the whey to drain away. 
there are also a number of craft workshops at Botton that teach residents how to make things that they can sell to raise money for the community. The wood workshop is a popular choice where villagers learn hands-on skills. They make all kinds of things including wooden toys that are exported as far as America. Finished cheddar wheels are stored to age and can take up to two years to mature. They need daily care, so Rob Rowland keeps them free of mould. My job is to clean the cheddars that are standing on these shelves. How I do it, salty water, uh, two cloths, one for cleaning the shelf with and one for cleaning the cheese with. It gets rid of the mould that forms all over the cheese eventually. I have had some, it's very nice. <laughs> it's very nice cheese, thanks. Yes. It looks like Rob will be a busy fella. By tea time, everyone is hungry, which is just as well. There's plenty of great quality cheese on the menu. For creamery manager Alistair, community spirit is the key to Botton's success. Botton cheese means that it's been made with a lot of love and care, right through from the milking of the cows, right through to the way we, we try and handle the milk in the cheese vat, the, the whole production. Our passion does make the cheese taste different. Everybody's energy is in the cheese and the enthusiasm's there. It really makes a different cheese, which is one that's it's unique and tastes good. I'm delighted that our cheese producers, Ian, Rob and Alistair, have travelled down from Botton Village to join me. Hello, oh, good yeah. morning. Hello, Paul. Alistair, I think you're doing a fantastic job. I think from these cheeses here, I think they look incredible, you know. I mean, I've been in uh, a lot of uh, cheese-making places. Um, I was impressed. We've got a great team. We've got a, a really good place to make in Botton Village. And we've, we've really focused on the um, trying to get out a really quality product in what we do. It's a credit to all the people that work there. So do you enjoy your role as well? Do you enjoy working on the farm? I do. Is it it's a, um, tiring. Is it a big long, is it a long day? Yeah. Do you like the... Start at half past five in, in the, the morning. morning. Yeah. And then we finish at half six. Half six? That's yeah. nearly 13 hours. That's a big day. Yeah. Do you have a big dinner afterwards? Not much. <laughs> they don't feed you either. So you either work 13 hours a day, no food, I'm going to have to go up to this bottom farm, aren't I? I'm going to have to come up. <laughs> now, Rob, it looks very clean, the cheese, I must admit, from what I saw. Yes, yes I'm, I'm doing a really good job. I think it's uh, a really great, great thing to it's do. It's a fantastic thing, yeah, absolutely. Because now, you good. see, at, at the moment, I'm um, what, cleaning some really difficult cheeses. Yeah. Because there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of mould? The mould at the moment on them. Yeah. And yeah. they're, they're taking a little bit longer than the other ones. <laughs> get a big Brillo pan. <laughs> well, um, get it all off. So you've brought some a variety of different cheeses here as well. Now this one looks interesting. The brie, wow, that's ripe, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, the thing is about a brie, as far as I'm concerned, if you smell it and it smells like my socks, after I've been on a run, <laughs> like I run, <laughs> then you know that it's going to be a good brie. I mean, this one is so soft. Look at that. I, I did try and keep it in my socks last night, so... <laughs> just, just to get the, get the extra flavour. <laughs> He's a joker. Mmm. That's delicious. Thank is this you. popular? Yes. The, the brie is one of our, our popular cheese that we produce. Ooh. Actually, I've got a dish. I think I might do with that one as well at a later date. When you're looking at this yeah. cheese here, yeah. this is your cheddar. Yes. Now, this is the one I want to use in my dish. Yeah. And I'm going to make a cheese, onion, and potato pie. Now, when I was a little kid, my dad used to own a bakery. And so I used to get out of bed at about half three in the morning. So you've got a massive lie in. And I'd, I'd work through, but only to about half one. So I'd, I'd be on 10 hours. I'd only eat half day. You'd still be cracking on. Um, <laughs> and I used to always eat these cheese and onion pasties. And they were flaky pastry. And this is where the idea came from for this. It was something which, when you get a melted cheese, and that looks as though it's going to melt beautifully. Yeah. It's got such a beautiful smell. Yes. And I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to probably end up mashing down, mashing down the potato. And I've got some desires in there, which are, again, they, they're really fluffy potatoes. And then fold that in into there. Yes. And that is, it should be a beautiful pie. 
I start with a short crust pastry, which is also full of that lovely cheddar. Sorry, Rob, I can't use that. No, no. But I can use the main bulk of cheese. Now, yes. what I'm going to start with is the pastry. Now, I've got some flour here, to which I'm going to add some cheeses. Now, I've got your cheddar cheese here, which is finely grated. And I've got some parmesan going in there as well. And add a little bit, just a little touch of seasoning. I'm using butter for flavour and lard to give the pastry a crisp bite. And I'm adding just enough water to bind it all together. Get it all into one bulk, one piece. Pop that on the bench. I've got some flour here and get my mucky hands in there. Coat it in a little bit of flour. Just work that dough to bring it together. You can feel the cheese in it, actually, which is not a problem because you want to see those grains when you put it on top of the pie. Now, that is about right. Now, that goes into the fridge just to chill down a little bit and it makes it easier to roll out. Now, I'll come back to that later. For the filling, pre-boil some desiree potatoes until they're light, fluffy and ready for mashing. Give it a bit of grief. Smash these... This is a great job there. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to have a go? Do you want to have, have, yeah, have a go? Yes, Rob, I'll, have a, I'll have a break. I'll have a go. Right, Rob, you just need to smash down those potatoes, all right? Yes. You've got more strength than I have. I'm going to need two hands. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Takes a bit of work, doesn't it? Yeah. Do you like potatoes? Oh, I love potatoes. I love potato, cheese and potato pie. So what's your favourite cheese? Well, I would say uh, I like gouda and uh, I'll mm. taste... Tasted the cumin with gouda. Oh, yeah. Do you do that one as well? Cumin with gouda, don't, don't we, Alex? We, we, do, yep. we do that as well, Paul. Wow. I'm going to have to try that. Where is it? It's here. That one. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's one of our milder sort of cheeses that we produce. That's reasonably young. It's very uh, creamy, isn't it? Quite, yeah. I mean, the, the, cream, the creaminess comes out. That's delicious. Yeah. I reckon that's finished, Paul. I reckon that's done, mate. I reckon that's Thanks very much indeed, Rob. Right. That saves me a job. Yes, I think that's, <laughs> that's just good enough. Then chop and add some chives. And this is your beautiful cheese. Now, I'm going to get my grater here. I'm going to grate quite a big chunk of this, actually, because I think it's going to go exceptionally well inside this pie. Now, here's all the cheese. I'm going to put that straight in there. Roughly chop and add the onion and a dash of milk. Give it a good mix and spread it out on a baking tray. Now, you need to flatten this off as much as you can. A little bit of seasoning, white pepper, a bit of salt. Finally, to go on top of that, you need to put your pastry. Now, once your pastry's been in the fridge, if you bring it straight out, it might be too hard. So just leave it to come back to ambient temperature just for about five, ten minutes. Then it becomes soft, and now you should be able to roll that out very easily. The beauty of this pastry is it's very, very short. So when you eat it, it crumbles, and it's because of the amount of cheese in there. So it's very difficult sometimes to roll out. Let me just put this over the top, like so. Once you've stretched it, just try and trim off the ends with your hands or a knife. Take it to the outside. Easiest thing to do is with your hand and then drop that down into the, into the pie on top of the mashed potato, like so. How do you do that, a short pastry? Sure. I'll show you exactly what short means. There's your pastry, right? Yeah. Now, in a dough, that would stretch. Yeah. But watch what happens with this. Ah, OK. It, just it means it's breaks. short on gluten. It just breaks short. If that was a dough, you'd stretch that. Stretching. And that's all it is. Right. Then glaze the pastry with a beaten egg and it's ready to go in the oven at 200 degrees for 35 minutes. And then when you bring it out, you need to leave it to cool. Because I'd rather eat this warm than hot. And there you have it. You have your cheese, onion, potato pie with a beautiful cheese pastry lid. The crunchy shortcrust top is a perfect contrast to the smooth, cheesy potato filling. Guys, you're going to have to wait a little bit longer before we get a chance to eat it. Right. Great. I'll wait. We'll wait. We'll wait. <laughs> You'll we'll have wait. to. We'll, <laughs> wait. we'll wait. Earlier, chocolatier Paul Young taught me the art of tempering. 
Now I'm going to show him my chocolate and prune tart. I hope he'll help decorate it. Now this is going to be the chocolate and prune tart. In here I have the flour because it's chocolate. I'm adding cocoa powder to that straight in there. Again, it's beautiful. This will impart huge flavour and colour to the tart itself. Add icing sugar, an egg yolk, lemon juice and some butter. So while I'm crumbing this down, Paul, what have you decided to put on the top? I'm going to make the same crumpled texture. We're going to put really bright, shimmering gold and bronze powders on it to really lift it. So that bronzy colour for the prunes and then the gold bit will help the chocolate colours come through. Fantastic. So you're using proper gold? It has got some powdered gold in there, yeah, with uh, edible pigments, so it, it will be really sparkly. It's the sort of cake I grew up with, actually. With real gold on it? Yeah, all the time, out every oh. Sunday. <laughs> right. Mum used to use, lose the ring all the time. <laughs> Especially in puddings, you never see it. Oh, dear. Paul's gold trick is simple but effective. Sprinkle pigmented powder straight onto the acetate before pouring on the chocolate, and it'll coat just one side. OK, so what I'm doing here is crumbing down the dry mixture with the butter, turn it into breadcrumbs again, then add water and mix until it binds together. See how dark it actually becomes? It gets even darker with the liquid because the cocoa powder is beginning to melt. Beautiful pastry. Now, once you've got your pastry like that, work it for a bit so it doesn't break too easily, and then pop it in the fridge just to chill down for 10 minutes. Bring it out, leave it to come back to room temperature for about five, 10 minutes till it's nice and soft. Roll it out and line your tart shell. Now, when you've lined your tart shell, it looks like this, but what you must do is overlap the sides then bake it off. You need baking beans, the paper underneath, and it takes about 20 minutes, around 180 degrees. Bring it out and then trim it with a knife all the way around, nice and carefully. OK, that's your base done. Now, the filling, what I've got in here... I feel like a chocolate guy now. This is a basic ganache. So what you do is you warm the cream through, drop your chocolate into the cream, and then slowly just carry on stirring it and it'll begin to melt. Don't try and rush it. As Paul said, you'll have a problem with your chocolate. You will. It could split if you do it too quick or it could bake and go really grainy. It yeah. could overcook. Absolutely. So what I'm going to do to add to this, now that you've got a ganache, this is the unusual bit. In a separate bowl, put mascarpone, two eggs and whisk. Have you heard of this sort of tart before, Paul? Do you know what? I haven't made a prune tart. It was prune and armagnac for about ten years. And I absolutely love prunes, but I've never made it with chocolate, so I can't You're wait a chocolate to... man! I know! I've never made it with chocolate. I, I don't know why, so I'm looking forward to it. This should, this, it is fantastic. Now, that needs to be incorporated into the chocolates. Start off with a little bit first. You don't overwhelm the chocolates. And then add the remaining mixture of the mascarpone and egg. Again, mix that up. Look at the colour of me working with chocolate. It's everywhere. It's unbelievable. It's a nice, rich tart. So what we've basically got is the mixture, the filling to go inside the tart. Now, that gets poured in. This is going to be very chocolatey. But it's really wintry, isn't it? It's nice. It is. It is a very, very much a, a winter dish. Add the chopped prunes that have been soaked in boiling water, vanilla and brandy. Smell that. Oh, it's gorgeous. It's, it smells like a really rich sherry. Yeah, you know, I've actually used brandy in this. Gorgeous. So what you do then with the prunes is then spread them all over the top Will it add moisture to the tart as well? It will. And then it goes back into the oven at 180 degrees Celsius for about 25 minutes. When you bring it out, it will wobble slightly. Not as much as that. You can see that's liquid, but you almost get a jelly wobble in the middle, and that's when you know it's baked. Looks good. Over here is my finished tart. Beautiful. We've got that beautiful chocolate. It's full of prunes. Gorgeous, crispy chocolate shell. And, Paul, right. you finish that off. So we've done the same technique, tempered the chocolate, acetate shape, but this time lots of the gold powder, glitter powder, which you can buy in loads of websites, in department stores. It's come off as one sheet, so we're just going to smash it up. We've got some big bits here as well, look. And this is where you can really get dramatic. You can really go to town and get something really big and architectural on here. And this is where, if you're not artistic, you don't need to be. This really is about just making it a bit show-stoppy, a little bit different. And this will surprise your friends. You know, they will wonder how you've done it. There you go. Thank you, Paul. Beautiful. Look at that. A chocolate and prune tart 
topped with some beautiful tempered chocolate with pieces of gold. Delicious served on its own with fruit or even cream. This is a wonderful dish to end any meal. Now, Paul, we're going to have to wait a little bit longer before we get a chance to I eat. can't wait to try it. It's time for my guests who have helped me create these recipes to join me in eating them. Thanks, guys, for being so patient today. Uh, and thank you for bringing all your ingredients and expertise. I suppose we'd better start with the uh, cheese and onion. We should. It, looks, yeah. it smells good. It yeah, it does sound very, very good. My cheese, onion and potato pie. Thanks to Ian, Rob and Alistair, who provided the cheddar. My lemon and lavender posset with ingredients fresh from Le Cheers Garden. And the showstopper, the chocolate and prune tart, complete with gold decoration. Pass over the cheese. Oh, oh, sorry. Thank you very much. I love the softness of it. It's like sinking into a duvet or something. It's mm. really it soft. Mm. The taste is staying there as well. It's mm. sort of biting into it and just disappearing. It's, it's really sort of keeping the, the taste yeah. there. The main course is a hit. Now the desserts. This will hit your taste buds, something wrong. When you hit, when you get into that lemon pasta, the lemon will get you. The lavender will hit it as well. And there's also a little, a little biscuit yes. there as well. Yes. And actually, the best thing is to do, wow. get some of the posset, put it on top of the biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> That's the perfect amount of lavender for me. Mm. I don't like it too strong. Mm. Personally, I think with the biscuit and the posset together, it works. For me, it works. What, I mean, what do you think? For me, it? it's like being in a boxing match. The powers just pack a punch, and they're fighting each other. It's very exciting. Mm. That's what I'd say. Do you like it, Ian? It's um, very interesting. <laughs> you cheeky monkey. <laughs> Are you telling me you don't like that? No. That's the last time you come into my house, Ian. I was going to say stay for dinner, but it's not going to happen now. Right? <laughs> Do you like it, Rob? Yes, I, I do. love you, Rob. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's delicious. It's fantastic. Mm. And finally, my chocolate and prune tart, topped with Paul's tempered golden chocolate. That's a chocolate cake. That's like an aristocrat. Absolutely. The ones I've been eating before have been working class chocolate cakes. Yeah. All yeah. of a sudden, the aristocrat pops up here. Whoa, hang on a minute. What's this? Do you all love about it? It's not sugary at no, all. It's not. It's a very sophisticated adult taste. The prunes to absolutely infuse through all of the chocolate. Mm. Yeah. It's incredible. Do you like that one, Lichia? Do you like this? It's got a prune? wonderful kick that chocolate mm. gives mm. you as well. Absolutely lovely and complex as well. What do you think of the chocolate cake? It's very nice to eat something that's not too sweet. So you like that? Yeah. I love you, Ian. I just want you to know that. <laughs> Rob, do you like that chocolate cake? Yes, very much, very much so. And you're welcome back again. Alistair? I like that. I'm glad you enjoy it. Thank you. But you guys, uh, thank you for coming down. Have you enjoyed your stay? I we I have. Loved it here. I have. I've enjoyed it <laughs> very much. Yep. You're going to take all this home with you. You're not leaving this table until you can. <laughs> <laughs> it's your cheese. <laughs> I've had great fun today, and I hope you feel inspired to cook some of these delicious recipes. I'll have more pies and puds on the menu next time. See you then. Any more chocolate, anybody? Oh, I'll <laughs> <laughs>